Well, it has been quite an eventful week for our nation. That included the honoring of the civil rights legacy of Martin Luther King, the inauguration of our new president, and the Women's March on Washington. This week has magnified the divisions, the deep divisions that are among us. For some, this inauguration lifts their spirits, bringing great joy and hope for prosperity for our nation. While for others, this inauguration weighs heavily upon their spirits, fearing that the nation has taken a dark and dangerous turn. Today, in our Gospel reading, we hear of another inauguration, the inauguration of the Kingdom of Heaven, the Kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. News of the death of John the Baptist seems to have served as the flashpoint that motivates Jesus to move from Nazareth to make his home in Capernaum along the sea. This is the moment when the kingdom of God that John has been announcing becomes more than an announcement, but becomes the inauguration of God's kingdom. God's kingdom is inaugurated in Jesus Christ, who takes up where John left off, calling people to repent. Now there's a lot of geographical references made in the first part of today's reading. Galilee, Nazareth, Capernaum, Zebulun, Naphtali. It's easy for our eyes to glaze over when we hear those things being read, for they're places unfamiliar to most of us. So for us, they don't have a whole lot of meaning. But to sail past them would be to miss the significance of the inauguration that unfolds in today's text. Geography is important and symbolic. It tells a story of the past which impacts our future. For us, Valley Forge or Gettysburg or Pearl Harbor are more than dots on a map. They stir our memories and embody history that has tremendous significance for our nation. The places that Matthew mentions in today's text would have had significance to his audience as well. For you see, 700 years before Jesus, the northern tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun were conquered by Assyria. And as spoken in Isaiah, God promises that one day light would shine upon their darkness and deliver them from their captivity. Jesus makes his home in this same region of which Isaiah speaks, a region that is still under foreign occupation this time by Rome. So by bringing up Naphtali and Zebulun, Matthew is signaling to the people proclaiming that the fulfillment of God's promise in Isaiah is unfolding before them as Jesus makes his home in this region. By moving to Capernaum, Jesus is enacting the arrival of the long-awaited reign of God that is inaugurated through him and that will have an impact on the world. As Jesus begins his ministry, he shines light into the lives of some fishermen who are going about their ordinary lives of casting their nets. And Jesus begins calling disciples to follow him in serving God's kingdom, which he is proclaiming through his teaching and preaching and healing. Calling these fishermen to be his disciples, Jesus offers a new identity to them, to fishermen who'd never been before even questioned their place in life. They were fishermen. What more was there? 
but Jesus calls them to take their place in a movement of God that is happening through him. They're called to serve God's kingdom with Jesus in lifting up the lowly, in healing the sick, in feeding the hungry, in speaking truth to power, in bearing God's grace and love, justice and peace. He calls them to risk and to, cons to surrender control of their lives as they have known them up until that point. I confess one of the challenges of this story for me is that it's hard to imagine myself, and maybe you might feel the same way, dropping absolutely everything and leaving everyone I know to go and follow Jesus the way that these fishermen did. The truth is that you and I will never know if we had been there mending our nets with Simon and Andrew, James and John that day, whether or not we would have joined them to leave everything behind and to follow Jesus the way they did. For none of us have ever encountered Jesus in that same way. There are many ways that Jesus meets us and extends the call to follow, not just by coming alongside us when we're casting nets and look, dropping everything to go the way they did, but he meets us somewhere along the way and calls us to follow him. And the fact that you are here today and I am here today to worship him is evidence that we have been called somewhere, sometime in our lives, Jesus encountered us and asked us to follow him. He may not have asked us to leave everything behind like those fishermen, but we had to let go of something in order to follow him in order to be his disciple. Maybe we let go of our fears or our reputations or the secure plans that we had been making for our future. Or maybe we walked away from a destructive lifestyle or from old prejudices or from closed minds and unforgiving hearts. Maybe we turned our backs on needing to be in control of our lives. Whatever it was, we let go of something because we can't follow Jesus without leaving something behind. Letting go of things to follow Jesus doesn't happen just once. It's an ongoing process of our spiritual formation in Christ. The call often comes to us out of the blue in surprising ways when we least expect it. Mark was a member of a church where I served, and he was one of those people that you saw the light of Jesus shining through him. He volunteered with our youth ministry, taking a week of his vacation every summer to accompany them on their mission trips. When one of Mark's co-workers heard that he was taking a week of vacation and going on a missions, mission trip out of the state, the man critically commented, why do you have to spend all that money to go to West Virginia and repair houses when there's so many people in need right here in our own community? Mark's reply was, we're going to West Virginia because that's where Jesus called us to go. But it sounds like maybe Jesus has put this community on your heart and is calling you into this community to serve him here. Come and follow me. Jesus says this to unassuming fishermen and issues that same call to ordinary people like us going about our ordinary lives. 
The call comes in different ways to each one. Maybe for you it comes through that still, small voice within. Or perhaps it comes through the voice of a coworker who challenges you. Or through the vo voice of an adversary, or even through your concern for those who have no voice. This past week, as I reflected upon this scripture, I heard wild geese flying overhead in the dark, and I was reminded of this story that I share with you. Out of the night came the sound of wild geese flying. I ran to the house breathlessly, announcing the excitement that I felt. What is to compare with wild geese flying across the moon? It might have ended there except for the sight of our tame mallards on the pond. They heard the wild call that they had once known. The honking out of the night sent little arrows prompting deep into their wild yesterdays. Their wings fluttered a feeble response. The urge to fly, to take their place in the sky for which God made them was sounding in their feathered breasts. But they never rose from the water. The matter had been settled long ago. The corn of the barnyard was too tempting. Now their desire to fly only made them uncomfortable. When Jesus calls us to serve the purposes of God's kingdom that has been inaugurated in him, he will always call us beyond where we're standing, beyond the familiar, to risk new depths in our relationship with him and others. He calls us to leave the comfort of the barnyard, to risk doing something that we've never done before, to risk becoming someone that we're not even sure how to be. And you know, it's not just that we're taking a risk to follow Jesus Christ, but each time he calls us by our name, He's taking a risk on us. I sensed Jesus calling me the day morphine was mistakenly delivered to my apartment in Pasadena. I informed the delivery man that he had the wrong address and that the address he was looking for was the building next door to our apartment. At that time, I was seeking employment as a hospice chaplain, having moved to California a few months prior for my husband to work uh, on a degree at Fuller Seminary. Having served as a hospice chaplain in the past, I was familiar with narcotics being delivered to the homes of hospice patients. That day, sitting on the balcony of my apartment, I was feeling sorry for myself that I still hadn't been able to find work. And then I looked down over the fence that divided my building with the house next door, and I noticed a healthcare worker dressed in colorful scrubs taking out the trash. And this confirmed for me my suspicions that indeed someone next door was under hospice care. How ironic it seemed to me that here I was, a trained hospice chaplain, twiddling my thumbs while my neighbor next door was dying. And then Jesus' call came to me clear as day. He said, my job wasn't to be a hospice chaplain at that moment. My call was to pray for my neighbor. And so that became my vocation, to pray for my neighbor who was dying, for someone I never met, 
I was called to pray for them. The call to follow Jesus comes to each of us in different ways. Jesus calls us as ordinary people into new ways of living and being in the world with him and with one another. We are called to be citizens of God's kingdom, which is countercultural to the ways of this world's kingdom in which we live. Presidential inaugurations will come and go, but the inauguration of God's kingdom is forever. In the midst of the bitter divisions of our nation today, Jesus calls his church, calls us as his disciples, to remember that our identity is in him and not in any particular political party or in any particular nation. We are called to leave the comfort of ordinary lives to serve God's kingdom. We're called to risk following Jesus by working for reconciliation, by embodying God's kingdom values in the way we treat one another, and especially when we disagree with one another, by working for the dignity and rights of all people in the name of Jesus. And above all, we are called to do what perhaps is the hardest thing of all. We're called to love and to pray for our enemies. In response to Jesus calling to us, I invite us now to risk following Jesus into a time of silence and prayer as a sign that we are about God's kingdom, that that is where we find our identity. And I'm going to ask you right now to think of a person with whom you disagree, perhaps a person who you might even consider to be your enemy. And I'm giving you a, a few seconds to, to think about that. Someone who you feel in opposition with when you have that person in mind, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and to picture them and see them through the loving eyes of Jesus and to pray for them as a beloved child of God. Jesus calls ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And never has there been a better time in our nation for us to rise up and heed the call of Christ than we are finding ourselves in today. Let us be willing to leave our nets and follow Jesus into this time of prayer for the person that God has put on your heart this morning. We will enter into a time of silence for one minute holding them before the Lord. Let us pray.
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.